Chapter 1 Light and Darkness The man and the woman danced around the office holding each other. They smiled and laughed as they danced. They had their arms around each other. They danced and they danced. They did not want this moment to go away. We did it, John. We really did it. I know it did, Jenny. I know. John was a television producer and Jenny was his assistant. They were getting excited about the series of six television programs they had made. The series was called Know Your Mind, Love Your Body. It was about the relationship between the body and the mind. Each program had looked at a different subject. Other forms of medicine, meditation, yoga, a good diet and so on. It had not been an expensive series to make, but it had been John's idea. He felt there was a growing interest in the subject, but even he had been surprised by the size of the audiences and the interest in the newspapers. Tell me again what the boss said, John. He said he thinks it's the best series he's seen since ever, and he talked about how much the newspapers love the programs. Our managing director is a very, very happy man. He wants to talk to me about money, about my salary, about giving me a rise. Would you believe? The smile disappeared from Jenny's face for a second when he talked about his salary. And a rise for you too, of course, John added. Jenny's smile returned. He thinks it might win the Montreal Gold Prize for Best Dog Montreal Program. It's fantastic, said Jenny. We did it. It's a success. We really did it. Jenny was dancing by herself now. Of course, it's successful. John jogged. We believe it will be successful. And it is successful. If you believe in something, it will happen. It may not happen exactly the way you want, but it will happen. If you believe that something is true, it becomes true. And that's what the program were all about. Have you talked to Radia yet? Jenny asked, bringing me back to the present. I haven't had a chance to phone Radia yet. I've just got off the phone with the managing director. I haven't had a chance. I'll do it now. But listen, let's talk over lunch. I have an idea for another program. Rachel was John's wife. She was the first person he always ran to talk to when he had good news or bad news or no news or when he felt low or when he felt good. They had been married for just under two years and in that time, they had kept no secret from each other. They had told each other everything. It was why their relationship was so good, so strong. They discussed how they felt, what they were thinking, what they had done, everything. They had no secret from each other. He had picked up the phone and turned his back on Jenny before she had even moved, moved toward the door, but she didn't mind. Jenny knew him. She knew his love for his wife and son. She knew how excited he was. She left the room smiling to herself. Only it should be like this, she thought. But no, then they wouldn't be special. And this was his special day. John sat down at his desk with the phone in his hand. He looked happily around his office and out of the window. The view from his fourth floor office were some of the best in London. The houses of apartments were to the west. Tower Bridge was so close you could imagine reaching out and touching it, and the whole building overlooked the river dams. The river was busy today. There were boats carrying tourists and office workers having a birthday party on a hired pleasure boat. Even the river police looked relaxed today as they went up and down the river doing work that they were often unpleasant. John almost never took time to look out of the window. He sometimes asked himself why the television company has spent so much money on the building and this beautiful but expensive part of London. 
Everyone who worked in the building was either of making fun or so busy in meetings that they never looked out to enjoy the view. Probably the building with its view was for the visitors from other British and foreign television companies who came to buy their programs. It was big, big money. And the least you could do for these important men and women was offer them such a view. Maybe it helped sell the programs, especially on a beautiful spring morning like this. At this moment, John felt very good about himself as he looked at his office, as he thought about the success of his programs. But then he remembered the phone in his hand, and that he wanted to talk to Rachel. He paused and put the phone down again. John was worried about Rachel. She had not seemed happy for the last couple of weeks. She had seemed nervous, worried about something, worried most of all, all about Patrick, their young son. She had not wanted to go out anywhere recently. He had gone out of alone at least three times in the last two weeks, to a party, to a play, to dinner with friends, that kind of thing that Rachel loved. But she had not wanted to go out of the house, she had not wanted to leave Patrick. Twice she had woken up screaming in the middle of the night after bad dreams, and had jumped out of the bed and run to Patrick's room. She had picked picked him up and held him tight in her arms. She had pushed her face against him, crying and shaking as she held him until slowly her crying stopped and she put him down gently in his bed. She had not returned to their bedroom and John had gotten up and gone to her and led her back to bed. What was it? he asked as he put his arms around her and held her. What was it, my love? What happened? he repeated. I don't know. I don't know. I just knew that something bad had happened to Patrick. I don't know. I was looking for him. I couldn't find him anywhere. I don't know what it was. I was just so frightened. He held her again. As she started to cry once more and held her like that until she fell asleep. At first, she moved and even shook in his arms, and then she fell into more gentle sleep, her breath soft on his cheek. When she had woken, she had not wanted to talk about the dream, had not wanted to remember, and so they had let it go. But later, the same day, she had run from their car with Patrick in her arms, and John had started the engine. Since then, she had refused to go anywhere in the car. Since then, if she had to go anywhere, she went on foot, carrying Patrick in her arms. She stopped every time a car came past. Her lips pressed together in a tight line, her hands held around Patrick as if to protect him, as if she was afraid something was going to happen to him. It was strange, John thought, to feel so successful and so worried at the same time. He picked up the phone again to call Rachel. His earlier assignment now gone, and he wondered what it was. His wife was trying to protect Patrick from.